Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, Change from Within. We speak with the founder of Etsy.org about helping business people build a better world. And the WorkX Printing Cooperative takes us through a brief recent history of manufacturing and trade agreements. All that and a few words from me on New Economy Week. Welcome to our program. It's one thing to hear Pope Francis talk about eradicating poverty and the need to change the way we do business for the sake of our souls and the planet. It's quite another to hear that sort of talk coming from entrepreneurs whose bread and butter is commerce. But that's just what one hears from Etsy, the world's largest certified socially responsible business. Not satisfied with pioneering a $3 billion global crafts market, earlier this year Etsy launched a business education program for business people who want to make a better world. Here to tell us about Etsy.org and this new pilot program is Matthew Stinchcomb, Etsy.org's director, and Donna Scarpa, Senior Minister for Judson Memorial Church in Greenwich Village. Welcome to the program, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. A minister and a businessman. This might be a first <laughs> at this table. No one's ever called me that before. <laughs> you were the um, VP for vision and values. Uh, uh, values is that and right? impact. That's right. So you did that. You I had enough that. values and impact. That's it. We we figured it all out. They didn't need me anymore. Remind no. people or tell people if they're not familiar with Etsy, the business side. Yep. What is it? Uh, Etsy is a marketplace <laughs> for handmade and vintage goods. Um, we started in Brooklyn ten years ago and now there's about 1.6 million people who sell the things that they make or curate or find uh, on Etsy.com. So why do we need Etsy.org? Um, well, Etsy.com's mission is to reimagine commerce in ways that build a lasting and fulfilling world. And when we were thinking about starting a nonprofit, um, I started with that mission and I said, well, if we're trying to reimagine how business is practiced, we need to reimagine how it's taught too. Uh, David Orr, who as a professor at Oberlin where I went to school, said once uh, the skills, aptitudes, and attitudes needed to industrialize the earth are different from those that are needed to heal the planet, build durable, durable economies and good communities. And I started thinking then, well, if we're really trying to build a lasting and fulfilling world, what are the skills and maybe more importantly the attitudes uh, that we need to instill in entrepreneurs to be able to do that? Mm. And what's a minister doing wrapped up in all of this, Donna? <laughs> Well, there's so much unnecessary suffering in the world, and so much of it is based on people not having enough resources, internally and externally. And when I met Matt, he was giving the E.F. Schumacher lecture at Judson, mm -hmm. and uh, I thought everything he said sounded so Christian. Judson Church <laughs> in me. Greenwich Village in New York. Yes. And... Um, so I emailed him and said, wow, that was a great talk. You ever want to get together? And 24 hours later, we were having coffee. <laughs> and he was outlining his vision for the alleviation of unnecessary suffering through business education. And we talked about creating a whole new business school. And we talked about uh, what Ben Cohen of Ben & Jerry said about how the system is not broken, it's fixed, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we wanted to refix it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's how, and we've just hit it off, and we're ready to start this new program on Friday. Well, let's talk about it. So, so this pilot program launches this fall. Mm -hmm. um, what's it going to look like? Who's part of it? How do people get to be part of it? Sure. Um, well, we've got 22 entrepreneurs uh, in our pilot program. We put up an application. Uh, it's 16 weeks long. A uh, variety of uh, industries, variety of um, uh, time spent in business, so some real veterans, some newcomers. And, um, you know, we, we put out a program that has kind of three main focus areas. So the first, I would say, is uh, personal development, mm -hmm. uh, l you know, living in a kind of um, self-examined life on some level because as you know Donna was, was alluding to a little bit I feel like if we're going to change uh, the business the way we approach business it really is a shift in, in consciousness that's needed um, we need to change our definition of what success looks like we need to uh, cultivate the capacity for greater greater empathy in the world so there's a lot of this kind of personal work in order to be able to move forward uh, with business 
uh, in a way that's truly regenerative, not just for you, but for the, the people and places that are touched by your enterprise. So it really is possible to make a successful business without working every hour of every day, ignoring your family and exploiting people? Uh, I've heard, you know, it could happen. <laughs> so, yeah, so there's the personal piece, then the systems piece. So what are the, the social, um, ecological, the financial systems that we're living in? What is our relationship to those systems? And then the third piece is the business skill training. So how do we use business as the tool to actually have net positive impact for all the stakeholders? Well, so talk a little bit about how you do that. I remember we've had John Fullerton of the Capital yeah. Institute on this program, and he's talked about how the very essence of the financial system quarterly returns, quarterly reports, um, having to report back so frequently to your board uh, members and your shareholders, it, it mitigates against long-term thinking, against worrying about the planet, against really all the things you're talking about. H how do you shift that as one operation inside this huge superstructure? Well, I think a lot of that falls back on the, the kind of radical self-inquiry and, and trying to come to terms with what success really means for you. Mm -hmm. um, coming into a deeper understanding of the, the way that the systems work or don't work uh, in this world. And then um, exploring the fear, exploring the uncertainty, exploring the things that actually keep us from doing business in unusual and beautiful mm -hmm. ways. And, and I think it's possible, but not without that kind of personal piece. Mm -hmm. and also the cultivation of a strong network of support. So the community, the cohort that you're going through the business and the network that you develop <laughs> around your business. So now I'm beginning to hear echoes of Saul Alinsky, who was one of your trainers, I understand. Yes. You're one of the first women trained by the great community organizer in Chicago. Strengthening networks, getting to know your community. Unlearning capitalism. <laughs> Unlearning the negative Apart. So capitalism may be a fine system, but it's gotten way too big for its britches and it's hurting people. As you said, we live in a ridiculous time famine. And unfortunately, we have internalized capitalism. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of unlearning that has to be done and then relearning that so, has to be so done. So what do you mean? We've internalized capitalism because every <laughs> exchange is somehow a Commodified. Mm -hmm. Commodified. I mean, more is better, right? Mm -hmm. Not really. Uh, <laughs> less is more mm -hmm. for a lot of people. There's a lot more space for beauty and innovation if you clear that ridiculous, aggressive, I want, I'm hungry, I'm starving. And then you get all that, as we know many people do, and they're still hungry and they're still starving and they're living in more of a time famine. So it is, uh, we call it spiritual entrepreneurship, where the person is changed in such a way that the business is changed, in such a way that the world is changed, and it, it's, it's transformation. So give me an example of, of a person changed and a business changed. Maybe I'll let you off on the world right away. <laughs> you know, an example I think that's often cited, but for good reason, is the Grayston Bakery um, mm -hmm. up in Yonkers. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the, the, that's actually one of the places where the participants will be going and meeting with Bernie Glassman, who founded the bakery in 1982, and um, Mike, who's their current CEO. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was actually speaking at an event last week at Columbia, and um, they had one of the employees who worked there telling his story, and I was, you know, brought to tears just hearing about how his life was transformed because Grayston had just given him a chance and given him the opportunity. Grayston, as you may know, has an open hiring policy, mm -hmm. so anyone can walk in the door, <clears throat> a homeless person, a formerly incarcerated person, and they put their name on a list, and when a job comes up, that's their job. Mm -hmm. And this is a successful business that is transforming Yonkers. They take the profits from the bakery uh, and invest them into affordable housing and childcare and all of these things. And so, you know, what I became convinced of over 10 years at Etsy is that business is very powerful. Um, and it's a powerful tool for shaping a community. Mm -hmm. Problem is that we tend to shape communities or very large businesses can shape communities in mm -hmm. ways that are really degenerative. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can use that same powerful engine in ways that are very regenerative. Mm -hmm. So Grayston to me is a really great example of that. And how can we do this in, you know, in hand in hand with policy changes? Because I think everybody at this table has said um, we can make a change, but the change has to be bigger than us, too. I think you begin by building a base of successful change agents who are happier, 
<laughs> more satisfied. We're not against making money mm -hmm. in this program. It'll be great if somebody makes lots of money, as long as the objective is not just that aggressive more, mm -hmm. uh, it, so that the money gets reinvested. So we uh, will teach things like worker ownership, which is a magnificent strategy. Uh, you know, my personal hope, it's not about this program, is that somebody in policy terms says you can only make 150 times what the smallest wage earner in your business makes, you know? Or, or five times. Or five the times. Mon the Mondragon <laughs> Food Co-ops, I believe, I yeah. think it's something like 15 times or yeah, something. Yeah, I don't know it's, the It's number, not but nothing, yeah. but it's yeah. definitely but, a cap. But something that begins to show people that there's another way. And so alternatives have to be imagined, they have to be developed, they have to be carefully developed. Mm -hmm. My hope for this first cohort is that they'll be so good that they'll be leaders in a movement for alternative economic systems. Can you tell us about some of the people who are in the pilot program? Sure. Um, like I said, there are 22 entrepreneurs. Um, We've got uh, a woman named Agatha in Greenpoint who runs a bakery uh, with, I think, 46 employees. Uh, a guy named David up in the Bronx who has a dancewear company that he's had for 40 years up there. We've got, there's two women in the cohort who are starting underwear companies, both with a focus on women's health. Uh, two different angles, but really, really interesting businesses. They're, they're just starting out, mm -hmm. so they're pre-revenue. And it's a really... I think great, uh, great mix of of new and experience, and uh, what we're hoping very much is that the the participants will really also be the teachers in this program. So we're very much trying to change the dynamic of you know uh, this is a teacher who has all the answers and sit down and listen mm -hmm. to it. It's really about what emerges from this group mm -hmm. and unlocking the wisdom that they all have to support one another. And yet you're a global business yeah. and your goals are global in a sense when it comes to the modeling. How do you balance that kind of global marketplace which just about every one of your sellers, particularly the successful ones, mm -hmm. needs to thrive with this interest in, in localism mm -hmm. and committing to regenerating local communities. Yep. Um, well, I don't see the... Uh, I can understand why there might be some <laughs> tension there, but I don't see it that way. So Etsy is comprised of uh, a very big number of small things rather than it's you know a small mm -hmm. number of very big things. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's actually kind of the flip that needs to happen mm -hmm. when we think about corporations today. Um, so when I think about the program that we're doing, it's actually about... Um, cultivating um, a big number of these tiny place-based businesses that know and honor the places where they operate. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I used to have a lot of um, concerns about Etsy.com, the mm -hmm. size that we're becoming too big. You know, I'm mm -hmm. reading Schumacher, Small is Beautiful, and all of these things. And, wow, we're, you know, a 20-person company, a 50-person company, a 100, now maybe an 800-person company. Um, but I also know that that Etsy hasn't changed anything about its business model. We're still charging 20 cents for a listing and taking 3.5% commission when something sells. So as we grow, it's only because there's this huge number of, of small place-based entities that are actually being successful. Mm. So I actually think that, you know, and, and I, it gets to a really interesting conversation around scale, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I think is, is a very important conversation. And I'm sure one of the ones right you'll have with your... With your 100%. You know, I, I really like the idea of scaling deeply rather than, you know, just becoming very large. So how do we create actually, how do we scale through creating um, a big number of small place-based economies that, that are replicable. Donna, mm -hmm. I could see you want to come in on this. No, I think what you said is just right. about It's such a good question about, you know, how big do you have to be <laughs> to matter? And spiritually, we talk about vocation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what? why do you get up in the morning? Why, why do you care? Why do you work? And so many people have lost such a sense of vocation. Yeah and go to garbage jobs to do garbage work to make things that people don't really need. And it, it's, it's destructive to their lives. So the value of having a business, making something that's honorable and decent and making it in a good way is an intrinsic value that has its own merit. Mm. And we want to 
help people see that, the forgotten wisdom of having a vocation instead of a job. A livelihood. Uh, and, I mean, why live for your vacation? <laughs> so we're almost out of time, but I have one short question jotted down here, which is, Capitalism, the dung of the devil. Discuss. <laughs> Any thoughts on what the Pope had to say on his visit? I'm, uh, I'm in love with the Pope. Uh, oh I just, let's just uh, put it that way. And yesterday I preached a sermon called What the Pope Can Do and Can't Do. And it attends this question of size. Yeah. I don't want him to be a successful totalitarian leader. I want him to fail. I want him to get out of the way of the millions of people who want a stake in their life, who want to participate in their life, who wanted to be pointed in a good direction and then make it themselves. Mm. So it, I don't want the Pope to succeed as uh, this whole business of touching him and Pope bobbleheads and people being too crazy about him. Um, it's too big. And it's that sneaky form, again, of internalized capitalism that will kill us and it will destroy the planet and the turtles. <laughs> and it's rapidly almost there. So let's stop it. <laughs> and, and not just stop it. I'm so sick of protests. That's really why I'm hooking up <laughs> with Matt. I'm so sick of protesting the bad. I really want to develop mm. the good. Well, thank you both for doing that. Matthew, Donna, great to hear from you. And I hope that we can stay in touch with your pilot project yeah. and see how it goes. Thank you. We'd love to find out more. You can get more information at our website. Thanks for watching. Everyone knows that the system is broke and nobody knows how to fix it because most people don't know where we went wrong. Well, the exit represents a, a journey through the global system of merchandise. My name's Kevin O'Brien and I'm the founder of Ethics Ventures and the Works Printing Cooperative. And anyone who was born in the, or lived in the 90s, 1990s or before, know that there was a time, uh, good wages, proper health care, and retirement. NAFTA in the late 90s started the onslaught of free trade agreements. Very few working Americans completely understood the horrific ramifications they would have. Factory closures, job loss, economic downturn, and ultimately the loss of the power of the middle class. Kathy Lee Gifford, who was America's darling and, and had control of the morning airwaves, uh, had made a deal with Walmart to sell a clothing line branded Kathy Lee. The great muckraking of Charles Kernigan helped uncover that that clothing was being sewn in sweatshops by children. And although Walmart and Kathy Lee tried to deny it vehemently, ultimately the truth was dragged out to the light. We Americans realized that that social contract had been broken, not by us individually, but by the politicians who we entrusted the contract to. Everyone expected that our progressive president, Bill Clinton, would come to the rescue. But sadly, his rescue was that of the companies and brands who were the core of the problem. People took to the streets of Seattle in 1999 at the World Trade Organization meeting and demanded that we stop these atrocities. This new social justice movement brought together activists with business leaders like Ben Cohen of Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream. Sweatex was the resulting company, and it was beloved by the movement. It was quite literally a perfect company and a perfect model for the global justice movement. Although the business model was sound, no one could have expected or predicted that the company would fail. This huge national story under this huge spotlight actually turned out to be a huge disappointment. And Swedex, after just a couple years of business operation, ended up closing its doors in 2004. It didn't fail because of the concept of cooperative ownership or labor representation. It failed because of the awesome forces working against it to keep the status quo of racism, sexism, abuse, slavery, and environmental poisoning of the global apparel marketplace.
In 2005, Chris Mackin and Pierre Ferrari sat down with me and we decided that we weren't going to let it go, that this was the right model and this was the right time. Together, we launched Ethics Ventures with the sole purpose of keeping this model moving forward. Ethics has been able to join buyers from thousands of progressive organizations, churches, labor unions, and people who just want to do the right thing. It helps them pool their dollars to ensure that anything that they buy with their logo on it is made in the highest ethical conditions. In 2014, we were able to realize our dream and launch the Works Printing Cooperative. Any organization who cares about the labor that goes into their merchandise and the environmental standards of their merchandise can benefit by using Works. In partnership with the United Steelworkers, we're applying the same Mondragon Worker Cooperative model to the printing industry. Works is changing the world one project at a time. Works is part of a growing movement of union co-ops. One worker, one vote. We're treating people the way that we want to be treated. You can get more information about WorkX at our website. It's amazing how money media cover activists when they die. When radical philosopher and organizer Grace Lee Boggs passed away October 5th, she received long, respectful obituaries in just about every national paper. Activist and revolutionary, trailblazer, human rights advocate, they called her. Boggs, it was noted, lived to 100 years old. But it shouldn't take a century for the media to notice people like Boggs, the activists in their hometowns. Grace wrote, People are aware that they cannot continue in the same old way, but they're immobilized because they can't imagine an alternative. We need a vision that recognizes that we are one of the great turning points in human history. In money media, that vision is sorely lacking. When they cover community organizing at all, profit-driven media tend to focus only on the troublemakers, the sit-ins, shutdowns, and picket lines. But while activism is often used to extract concessions, and we love troublemakers, organizers like Boggs don't just make trouble, they also make change. At The Laura Flanders Show, we have the great privilege of meeting up close and personal the people and organizations that are developing sophisticated ways, not just to stand up to power, but to build and use power and use it differently. Tate Boggs in Detroit, the most radical thing she ever did, she once said, was to stay and create programs that build a sense of pride and ownership among local people through planting gardens and painting murals and more. In Buffalo, New York, the group Push Buffalo combines political campaigning with capacity building so local residents can renovate abandoned houses to the latest ecological standards once they win control. In the Rockaways in central Brooklyn, New York, we've reported on the Working World's Co-op Academy, which teaches working people the basics of business planning and raising capital. And as we've reported here, residents all over this city, New York, and others too, are learning about priority setting as they participate in local budgeting. November 9th through 15th is New Economy Week, five days of events focused on transforming society. People will be lifting up visions, but also concrete models. It wouldn't require so much imagination if only the media paid attention. To tell me what you think, write to me, Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.com, and thanks. What would our world look like today if our media showed us as much collaboration as they do competition? What if we got to meet people making change right here, right now, in all sorts of ways we're usually told are impossible? Subscribe today to The Laura Flanders Show for in-depth interviews with forward-thinking people. Smarts, not sound bites, every week, right here. Subscribe, and thanks. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, Avi Lewis, the director of a brand new film, This Changes Everything. Climate change changes everything. We are in for dramatic physical change to our world. 
one way or another. When you see communities who are thrown into the front line, you see the incredible transformation. They become stronger, they stand up. Today on The Laura Flanders Show, Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. So there was slavery all across the world, but in most countries, slavery was a transitional status. It could happen to anyone. It was not permanent. They were societies with slaves. America became something different. We became a slave society. Later in the show, we find out how your community can be part of his history-marking project. Join us in this conversation so that we can move forward together.